Absolution by Siegfried Sassoon Read by Wesley Thompson Smith for LibriVox.org The anguish of the earth absolves our eyes Till beauty shines in all that we can see War is our scourge, yet war has made us wise And fighting for our freedom we are free Horror of wounds and anger at the foe And loss of things desired All these must pass we are the happy legion, for we know time's but a golden wind that shakes the grass. There was an hour when we were loath to part from life we long to share no less than others. Now having claimed this heritage of heart, what need we more, my comrades and my brothers? End poem. The Creation by James Weldon Johnson Read by Robert Garrison for LibriVox.org And God stepped out on space, And he looked around and said, I'm lonely, I'll make me a world. And far as the eye of God could see, Darkness covered everything, Blacker than a hundred midnights Down in a cypress swamp. Then God smiled, and the light broke, and the darkness rolled up on one side, and the light stood shining on the other, and God said, That's good. Then God reached out and took the light in his hands, and God rolled the light around in his hands until he made the sun. And he set that sun ablazing in the heavens, and the light that was left from making the sun God gathered it up in a shining ball and flung it against the darkness, spangling the night with the moon and stars. Then down between the darkness and the light he hurled the world, and God said, That's good. Then God himself stepped down, and the sun was on his right hand, and the moon was on his left. The stars were clustered about his head, and the earth was under his feet, and God walked, and where he trod, his footsteps hollowed the valleys out, and bulged the mountains up. Then he stopped, and looked, and saw, that the earth was hot and barren. So God stepped over to the edge of the world, and he spat out the seven seas. He batted his eyes, and the lightnings flashed. He clapped his hands, and the thunders rolled, and the waters above the earth came down, the cooling waters came down. Then the green grass sprouted, and the little red flowers blossomed. The pine tree pointed his finger to the sky, and the oak spread out his arms. The lakes cuddled down in the hollows of the ground, and the rivers ran down to the sea. And God smiled again, and the rainbow appeared, and curled itself around his shoulder. Then God raised his arm, and he waved his hand, over the sea and over the land, and he said, Bring forth, bring forth, and quicker than God could drop his hand, fishes and fowls and beasts and birds swam the rivers and the seas, roamed the forests and the woods, and split the air with their wings, and God said, That's good. Then God walked around, and God looked around on all that he had made. He looked at his sun, and he looked at his moon, and he looked at his little stars. He looked on his world with all its living things, and God said, I'm lonely still. Then God sat down on the side of a hill where he could think. By a deep wide river he sat down. With his head in his hands God thought and thought, till he thought, I'll make me a man. Up from the bed of the river God scooped the clay, and by the bank of the river he kneeled him down. And there the great God Almighty, who lit the sun and fixed it in the sky, who flung the stars to the most far corner of the night, who rounded the earth in the middle of his hand. This great God, like a mammy bending over her baby, 
kneeled down in the dust, toiling over a lump of clay till he shaped it in his own image. Then into it he blew the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Amen, amen. End of poem. Fire and Ice by Robert Frost. Read by Paul Gorman for LibriVox.org. Some say the world will end in fire, some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if it had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to know that for destruction, ice is also great and would suffice. End of poem. The Flower Boat by Robert Frost. Read by Paul Gorman for LibriVox.org. The fisherman's swapping a yarn for a yarn under the hand of the village barber. And here, in the angle of house and barn, his deep-sea dory has found a harbor. At anchor she rides the sunny sod as full to the gunnel with flowers a-growing as ever she turned her home with cod from George's bank when winds were blowing. And I know from that Elysian freight she will brave but once more the Atlantic weather when dory and fisherman sail by fate to seek for the happy isles together. End of poem. For Once Then, Something by Robert Frost. Read by Paul Gorman for LibriVox.org. Others taught me with having knelt at well curbs, always wrong to the light, so never seeing deeper down in the well than where the water gives me back a shining surface picture, me, myself, in the summer heaven, godlike looking out of a wreath of fern and cloud puffs. Once, when trying with chin against a well curb, I discerned, as I thought, beyond the picture, through the picture, a something white, uncertain, something more of the depths, and then I lost it. Water came to rebuke the too clear water. One drop fell from a fern and lo, a ripple shook whatever it was lay there at bottom, blurred it, blotted it out. What was that whiteness? Truth? A pebble of quartz? For once, then, something. End of poem. Hiawatha's Photographing by Lewis Carroll Read for LibriVox.org by Kara Schallenberg Author's Note in an age of imitation, I can claim no special merit for this slight attempt at doing what is known to be so easy. Any fairly practised writer, with the slightest ear for rhythm, could compose for hours together in the easy running metre of the Song of Hiawatha. Having, then, distinctly stated that I challenge no attention in the following little poem to its merely verbal jingle, I must beg the candid reader to confine his criticism to its treatment of the subject. From his shoulder Hiawatha took the camera of rosewood, made of sliding, folding rosewood, neatly put it all together. In its case it lay compactly, folded into nearly nothing, but he opened out the hinges, pushed and pulled the joints and hinges, till it looked all squares and oblongs, like a complicated figure in the second book of Euclid. This he perched upon a tripod, crouched beneath its dusky cover, stretched his hand, enforcing silence, said, Be motionless, I beg you. Mystic, awful, was the process. All the family, in order, sat before him for their pictures. Each in turn, as he was taken, volunteered his own suggestions, his ingenious suggestions. First the governor, the father. He suggested velvet curtains, 
looped about a massy pillar, and the corner of a table, of a rosewood dining-table. He would hold a scroll of something, hold it firmly in his left hand, he would keep his right hand buried, like Napoleon, in his waistcoat. He would contemplate the distance with a look of pensive meaning, as of ducks that die in tempests. Grand, heroic was the notion, yet the picture failed entirely, failed because he moved a little, moved because he couldn't help it. Next his better half took courage, she would have her picture taken, she came dressed beyond description, dressed in jewels and in satin, far too gorgeous for an empress. Gracefully she sat down sideways, with a simper scarcely human, holding in her hand a bouquet rather larger than a cabbage. All the while that she was sitting, still the lady chattered, chattered, like a monkey in the forest. "'Am I sitting still?' she asked him. "'Is my face enough in profile? Shall I hold the bouquet higher? Will it come into the picture?' And the picture failed completely. Next the sun, the stunning cantab, he suggested curves of beauty, curves pervading all his figure, which the eye might follow onward, till they centred in the breastpin, centred in the golden breastpin. He had learnt it all from Ruskin, author of The Stones of Venice, Seven Lamps of Architecture, Modern Painters, and some others. And perhaps he had not fully understood his author's meaning, but whatever was the reason, all was fruitless, as the picture ended in an utter failure. Next to him the eldest daughter. She suggested very little, only asked if he would take her with her look of passive beauty. Her idea of passive beauty was a squinting of the left eye, was a drooping of the right eye, was a smile that went up sideways to the corner of the nostrils. Hiawatha, when she asked him, took no notice of the question, looked as if he hadn't heard it, but when pointedly appealed to, smiled in his peculiar manner, coughed and said it, didn't matter, bit his lip, and changed the subject. Nor in this was he mistaken, as the picture failed completely. So, in turn, the other sisters. Last the youngest son was taken, very rough and thick his hair was, very round and red his face was, very dusty was his jacket, very fidgety his manners, and his overbearing sisters called him names he disapproved of, called him Johnny, Daddy's darling, called him Jackie, scrubby schoolboy, and so awful was the picture, in comparison the others seemed to one's bewildered fancy to have partially succeeded. Finally my Hiawatha tumbled all the tribe together. Grouped is not the right expression. And, as happy chance would have it, did at last obtain a picture where the faces all succeeded, each came out a perfect likeness. Then they joined, and all abused it, unrestrainedly abused it, as the worst and ugliest picture they could possibly have dreamed of, giving one such strange expressions, sullen, stupid, pert expressions. Really any one would take us, any one that did not know us, for the most unpleasant people. Hiawatha seemed to think so, seemed to think it not unlikely. All together rang their voices, angry, loud, discordant voices, as of dogs that howl in concert, as of cats that wail in chorus. But my Hiawatha's patience, his politeness and his patience, unaccountably had vanished, and he left that happy party. Neither did he leave them slowly with the calm deliberation, the intense deliberation of a photographic artist, but he left them in a hurry, left them in a mighty hurry, stating that he would not stand it, stating in emphatic language what he'd be before he'd stand it. Hurriedly he packed his boxes, hurriedly the porter trundled on a barrow all his boxes, 
Hurriedly he took his ticket, hurriedly the train received him. Thus departed Hiawatha. End of Hiawatha's Photographing by Lewis Carroll Read by Kara Schallenberg on March 7, 2006 In Oceanside, California This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In Hospital by William Ernest Henley In Hospital Waiting A square squat room a cellar on promotion, drab to the soul, drab to the very daylight, plasters astray and unnatural-looking tinware, scissors and lint and apothecary's jars. Here, on a bench, a skeleton would writhe from, angry and sore, I wait to be admitted. Wait till my heart is lead upon my stomach. While well, at their ease, two dressers do their chores. One has a probe. It feels to me a crowbar. A small boy sniffs and shudders after bluestone. A poor old tramp explains his poor old ulcers. Life is, I think, a blunder and a shame. End. Recorded by Marla Diane. March 10, 2006. Piscid West, Prince Edward Island. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Invictus by William Ernest Henley Out of the night that covers me, Black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be For my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance I have not winced nor cried aloud, under the bludgeonings of chance my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. End Recorded by Marlo Diane March 9, 2006 Piscid West, Prince Edward Island This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. The Jumblies by Edward Lear they went to sea in a sieve, they did. In a sieve they went to sea. In spite of all their friends could say, On a winter's morn, on a stormy day, In a sieve they went to sea. And when that sieve turned round and round, And everyone cried, You'll all be drowned, They called aloud, Our sieve ain't big, But we don't care a button, We don't care a fig, In a sieve we'll go to sea. Far and few, far and few, are the lands where the Jumblies live. Their heads are green and their hands are blue, and they went to sea in a sieve. They sailed away in a sieve, they did. In a sieve they sailed so fast, with only a beautiful pea-green veil, tied with a ribbon by way of a sail, to a small tobacco-pipe mast. And everyone said who saw them go, Oh, won't they be soon upset, you know? For the sky is dark and the voyage is long, And happen what may, it's extremely wrong In a sieve to sail so fast. 
The water soon came in, it did. The water soon came in. So to keep them dry, they wrapped their feet in pinky paper all folded neat, and they fastened it down with a pin. And they passed the night in a crockery jar, and each of them said, How wise we are! Though the sky be dark and the voyage be long, yet we never can think we were rash or wrong while round in our sieve we spin. And all night long they sailed away, and when the sun went down, they whistled and warbled a moony song to the echoing sound of a coppery gong in the shade of the mountains brown. O oh, Timbaloo, how happy we are when we live in a sieve and a crockery jar, and all night long in the moonlight pale we sail away with a pea-green sail in the shade of the mountains brown. They sailed to the western sea, they did, to the land all covered with trees, and they bought an owl and a useful cart, and a pound of rice and a cranberry tart, and a hive of silvery bees. And they bought a pig, and some green jackdaws, and a lovely monkey with lollipop paws, and forty bottles of rigaboree, and no end of stilton cheese. And in twenty years they all came back, in twenty years or more, and everyone said, how tall they've grown, for they've been to the lakes and the torrible zone, and the hills of the chankly boar. And they drank their health, and gave them a feast of dumplings made of beautiful yeast. And everyone said, if we only live, we too will go to sea in a sieve, to the hills of the chankly boar. Far and few, far and few are the lands where the jumblies live. Their heads are green, and their hands are blue, and they went to sea in a sieve. End of poem. Recorded by Molly Vischer in Richmond, Indiana, February 2006. The Lady of Shalott by Alfred Lord Tennyson. Recorded for LibriVox by Peter Eastman. March 5th, 2006. On either side the river lie long fields of barley and of rye that clothe the wold and meet the sky and through the field the road runs by to many towered Camelot. And up and down the people go, gazing where the lilies blow, round an island there below, the island of Shalott. Willows whiten, aspens quiver, little breezes dusk and shiver through the wave that runs forever by the island in the river, flowing down to Camelot. Four gray walls and four gray towers overlook a space of flowers, and the silent isle embowers the Lady of Shalott. By the margin, willow-veiled, slide the heavy barges, trailed by slow horses, and unhailed the shallop flitteth silken-sailed, skimming down to Camelot. Yet who hath seen her wave her hand, or at the casement seen her stand? Or is she known in all the land, the Lady of Shalott? Only reapers, reaping early, in among the bearded barley, hear a song that echoes cheerly, from the river winding clearly, down to towered Camelot. And by the moon, the reaper, weary, piling sheaves in uplands airy, listening, whispers, "'Tis the fairy, Lady of Shalott." There she weaves, by night and day, a magic web with colors gay. She has heard a whisper say, a curse is on her if she stay, to look down to Camelot. She knows not what the curse may be, and so she weaveth steadily, and little other care hath she, the Lady of Shalott. And moving through a mirror clear that hangs before her all the year, shadows of the world appear. There she sees the highway near, winding down to Camelot. There the river eddy whirls, and there the surly village churls, 
and the red cloaks of market girls pass onward from Shalott. Sometimes a troop of damsels glad, an abbot on an ambling pad, sometimes a curly shepherd lad, or long-haired page in crimson clad, goes by to towered Camelot. And sometimes, through the mirror blue, the knights come riding two and two. She hath no loyal knight and true, the Lady of Shalott. But in her web she still delights to weave the mirror's magic sights, for often through the silent nights a funeral with plumes and lights and music went to Camelot. Or when the moon was overhead, came two young lovers lately wed. I am half sick of shadows, said the lady of Shalott. A bowshot from her bower eaves, he rode between the barley sheaves. The sun came dazzling through the leaves, and flamed upon the brazen greaves of bold Sir Lancelot. A red cross knight forever kneeled to a lady in his shield that sparkled on the yellow field beside remote Shalott. The gemmy bridle glittered free, like to some branch of stars we see, hung in the golden galaxy. The bridle bells rang merrily as he rode down to Camelot. And from his blazoned baldric slung, a mighty silver bugle hung, and as he rode, his armor rung beside remote Shalott. All in the blue, unclouded weather, thick jeweled shone the saddle leather. The helmet and the helmet feather burned like one burning flame together as he rode down to Camelot. As often through the purple night, Below the starry clusters bright, Some bearded meteor trailing light Moves over still Shalott. His broad, clear brow in sunlight glowed, On burnished hooves his war-horse trode, From underneath his helmet flowed His coal-black curls, as on he rode, As he rode down to Camelot. From the bank, and from the river he flashed into the crystal mirror. Tira Lyra, by the river, sang Sir Lancelot. She left the web, she left the loom, she made three paces through the room, she saw the water lily bloom, she saw the helmet and the plume, she looked down, to Camelot. Out flew the web and floated wide, the mirror cracked from side to side. The curse has come upon me, cried the lady of Shalott. In the stormy east wind straining, the pale yellow woods were waning. The broad stream in his banks complaining, heavily the low sky raining over towered Camelot. Down she came, and found a boat beneath a willow left afloat, and around about the prow she wrote, The Lady of Shalott. And down the river's dim expanse, like some bold seer in a trance, seeing all his own mischance, with a glassy countenance did she look to Camelot. And at the closing of the day, she loosed the chain, and down she lay. The broad stream bore her far away, the Lady of Shalott. Lying, robed in snowy white, that loosely flew to left and right, the leaves upon her falling light, through the noises of the night, she floated down to Camelot. And as the boathead wound along, the willowy hills and fields among, they heard her singing her last song, the Lady of Shalott. Heard a carol, mournful, holy, chanted loudly 
chanted lowly, till her blood was frozen slowly, and her eyes were darkened wholly, turned to towered Camelot. For ere she reached upon the tide the first house by the waterside, singing in her song, she died, the Lady of Shalott. Under tower and balcony, by garden wall and gallery, a gleaming shape she floated by, dead pale between the houses high, silent into Camelot. Out upon the wharfs they came, knight and burgher, lord and dame, and around the prow they read her name, the Lady of Shalott. Who is this? And what is here? And in the lighted palace near died the sound of royal cheer, and they crossed themselves for fear, all the knights at Camelot. But Lancelot mused a little space. He said, She has a lovely face. God in his mercy lend her grace. The Lady of Shalott. End of poem. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marla Diane. Forbidden Dragon. Blogspot. Com. Lament of the Irish Emigrant by Helen Selina, Lady Dufferin I'm sitting on the stile, Mary, where we once sat side by side, on a bright maid morning long ago, when first you were my bride. The corn was springing fresh and green, and the lark sang loud and high. And the red was on your lip, Mary, and the love light in your eye. The place is little changed, Mary, the day is bright as then. The lark's loud song is in my ear, and the corn is green again. But I miss the soft clasp of your hand and your breath warm on my cheek, and I still keep listening for the words you never more will speak. "'Tis but a step down yonder lane, and the little church stands near. "'The church where we were wed, Mary, I can see the spire from here. "'But the graveyard lies between, Mary, and my step might break your rest, "'for I've laid you, darling, down to sleep with your baby on your breast. "'I'm very lonely now, Mary, for the poor make no new friends.' But, oh, they love the better still, the few our Father sends. And you were all I had, Mary, my blessing and my pride. There's nothing left to care for now, since my poor Mary died. Yours was the good, brave heart, Mary, that still kept hoping on. When trust in God had left my soul and my arm's young strength had gone, there was comfort ever on your lip and the kind look on your brow. I bless you, Mary, for that same, that you cannot hear me now. I thank you for your patient smile when your heart was fit to break, when the hunger pain was gnawing there and you hid it for my sake. I bless you for the pleasant word when your heart was sad and sore. Oh, I'm thankful you are gone, Mary, where grief can't reach you more. I'm bidding you a long farewell, my Mary, kind and true. But I'll not forget you, darling, in the land I'm going to. They say there's bread and work for all, and the sunshine's always there. But I'll not forget old Ireland, where it fifty times is fair. And often in those grand old woods I'll sit and shut my eyes, and my heart will travel back again to the place where Mary lies. And I'll think I see that little stile where we sat side by side, and the springing corn in the bright May morn when first you were my bride. End. Recorded by 
Marlo Diane February twentieth, two thousand and six Piscid West Prince Edward Island Lie Awake Song by Amelia Josephine Burr Read for Librivox dot org by Annie Coleman God has a house three streets away, and every Sunday, rain or shine, my nurse goes there, her prayers to say. She's told me of the candles fine, that, burning all night long, they keep because God never goes to sleep. Then there's a steeple full of bells, all through the dark the time it tells. I like to hear it in the night, and think about those candles bright. I wonder if God stays awake for kindness, like the furnace man who comes before its day to make our house as pleasant as he can. I like to watch the sky grow blue, and think perhaps the whole world through no one's awake. But just us three, God and the Furnace Man, and me. End of poem. Miss T by Walter de la Mare. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Peter Yearsley. It's a very odd thing, as odd as can be, that whatever Miss T eats, turns into Miss T. Porridge and apples, mince, muffins and mutton, jam, junket, jumbles, not a wrap, not a button, it matters, the moment they're out of her plate, though shared by Miss Butcher and sour Mr. Bate, tiny and cheerful and neat as can be, whatever Miss T eats, turns into Miss T. End of poem. My Last Duchess by Robert Browning Read by Paul Gorman for LibriVox.org That's my last duchess painted on the wall, looking as if she were alive. I call that piece a wonder now. Fra Pandolf's hands worked busily a day, and there she stands. Will please you sit and look at her? I said Fra Pandolf by design, for never read strangers like you that pictured countenance the depth and passion of its earnest glance. But to myself they turned, since none puts by the curtain I have drawn for you but I, and seemed as they would ask me, if they durst, how such a glance came there. So, not the first are you to ask thus. Sir, t'was not her husband's presence only called that spot of joy into the duchess's cheek. Perhaps Fra Pandolf chanced to say, her mantle laps over my lady's wrist too much, or paint must never hope to reproduce the faint half-flush that dies along her throat. Such stuff was courtesy, she thought, and cause enough for calling up that spot of joy. She had a heart, how shall I say, too soon made glad, too easily impressed. She liked whatever she looked on, and her looks went everywhere. Sir, was all one. My favor at her breast, the dropping of the daylight in the west, the bow of cherry some officious fool broke in the orchard for her, the white mule she rode with round the terrace, all and each would draw from her alike the approving speech, or blush at least. She thanked men, good, but thanked somehow, I know not how, as if she ranked my gift of a nine hundred year old name with anybody's gift. Who'd stoop to blame this sort of trifling? Even had you skill in speech, which I have not, to make your will quite clear to such an one, and say, Just this or that in you disgusts me, here you miss, or there exceed the mark. And if she let herself be lessened so, nor plainly set her wits to yours, forsooth, and made excuse, e'en then would be some stooping, and I choose never to stoop. Oh, sir, she smiled, no doubt, whene'er I passed her, but who passed without much the same smile? This grew, I gave commands, 
Then all the smiles stopped together. There she stands as if alive. Will please you rise. We'll meet the company below then. I repeat, the count your master's known munificence is ample warrant that no just pretense of mine for dowry will be disallowed, though his fair daughter's self, as I avowed at starting, is my object. Nay, we'll go together down, sir. Notice Neptune, though, taming a seahorse, thought a rarity, which Clows of Innsbruck cast in bronze for me. End of poem. The Sigh by Thomas Hardy Read by Gabriel Paluzzi for LibriVox.org Little head against my shoulder Shy at first, then somewhat bolder and up-eyed Till she, with a timid quaver, yielded to the kiss I gave her But she sighed That there mingled with her feeling some sad thought she was concealing, it implied. Not that she had ceased to love me. None on earth she said above me. But she sighed. She could not disguise a passion, dread or doubt in weakest fashion if she tried. Nothing seemed to hold us sundered. Hearts were victors. So I wondered why she sighed. Afterwards I knew her thoroughly. And she loved me staunchly, truly, till she died. But she never made confession why at that first sweet concession she had sighed. It was in our May, remember, and though now I near November, and abide till my appointed change unfretting, sometimes I sit, half regretting, that she sighed. End of poem. Sometimes by Thomas S. Jones, Jr. Read for LibriVox.org by Annie Coleman Across the fields of yesterday He sometimes comes to me A little lad just back from play The lad I used to be and yet he smiles so wistfully once he has crept within. I wonder if he hopes to see the man I might have been. End of poem. Sonnet 2 from Renaissance and Other Poems by Edna St. Vincent Millay Read for LibriVox.org by Tracy Hall Time does not bring relief. You all have lied who told me time would ease me of my pain. I miss him in the weeping of the rain. I want him at the shrinking of the tide. The old snows melt from every mountainside, and last year's leaves are smoke in every lane. But last year's bitter loving must remain heaped on my heart, and my old thoughts abide. There are a hundred places where I fear to go, so with his memory they brim. And entering with relief some quiet place where never fell his foot or shone his face, I say, there is no memory of him here, and so stand stricken, so remembering him. End of poem. This is a public domain poem for LibriVox.org, celebrating its 1,000th member registering. Recording by Robert Garrison. A Summer Night by Elizabeth Stoddard I feel the breath of the summer night, aromatic fire. The trees, the vines, the flowers are astir with tender desire. The white moths flutter about the lamp, enamored with light, and a thousand creatures softly sing a song to the night. But I am alone, and how can I sing praises to thee? Come, night, unveil the beautiful soul that waiteth for me. End of poem. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 2E. Introduction to Love Songs by Sarah Teasdale. 2E. I have remembered beauty in the night. Against black silences I wake to see a shower of sunlight over Italy and green Ravello dreaming on her height. I have remembered music in the dark, the clean, swift brightness of a fugue of box, and running water singing on the rocks when once in English woods I heard a lark. But all remembered beauty is no more than a vague prelude to the thought of you. You are the rarest soul I ever knew, lover of beauty, knightliest and best. My thoughts seek you as waves that seek the shore, and when I think of you, I am at rest. End of poem. To His Coy Mistress by Andrew Marvel, read by Paul Gorman for LibriVox.org. Had we but world enough and time, this coyness, lady, were no crime. We would sit down and think which way to walk and pass our long love's day. Thou, by the Indian Ganges side, shouldest rubies find. I, by the tide of umber, would complain. I would love you ten years before the flood, and you should, if you please, refuse till the conversion of the Jews. My vegetable love should grow vaster than empires, and more slow. An hundred years should go to praise thine eyes, and on thy forehead gaze. Two hundred to adore each breast, but thirty thousand to the rest. An age at least to every part, and the last age should show your heart. For, lady, you deserve this state, nor would I love at lower rate. But at my back I always hear time's winged chariot hurrying near. And yonder, all before us lie deserts of vast eternity. Thy beauty shall no more be found, nor in thy marble vault shall sound my echoing song. Then worms shall try that long-preserved virginity, and your quaint honor turn to dust, and into ashes all my lust. The grave's a fine and private place, but none, I think, do their embrace. Now, therefore, while youthful hue sits on thy skin like morning dew, and while thy willing soul transpires at every pore with instant fires, now let us sport us while we may, and now, like amorous birds of prey, rather at once our time devour than languish in his slow-chapped power. Let us roll all our strength and all our sweetness up into one ball and tear our pleasures with rough strife through the iron gates of life. Thus, though we cannot make our son stand still, yet we will make him run. End poem.